And so there have been a lot of postcards which were edited at that time. And you see on these postcards that they are very naive. They try to extrapolate on known technologies. For instance, you see here some kind of development uh, of the telephone. Here they thought that people would uh, fly in balloons. There was no notion of airplanes. And maybe the most uh, intriguing one is this one. You see five people around the fireplace. And in the middle of the fireplace, there's a piece of radium. And people believe that one could heat oneself with radium. Radium had just been discovered by Pierre and Marie Curie. And so this is a kind of very naive and very strange use of uh, nuclear power and nuclear energy. But it was absolutely impossible at that time to uh, predict the technologies of the 20th century because all these technologies were relying on the revolution of relativity and quantum physics, which I would like to describe this uh, today and next week. And of course, there is one person which is at the center of this discovery, it's Albert Einstein. And so we talk a lot about Einstein in these lectures. So I recall you here as a sentence of Lord Kelvin, the beauty and clearness of the dynamical theory which asserts heat and light to be modes of motion is at present obscured by two clouds. One of these clouds is the puzzle of the ether. And uh, I will talk about that today. And this led to relativity, which as we will see, and as you certainly know, upset the notion of space, time, and gravitation. And of course, Einstein was very young in 1905, he's at the center of this story. So the outline of the lecture will be as follows. I will start by recalling the Michelson-Morley experiment, which is the experiment uh, Lord Kelvin is referring to about the puzzle of the ether. I uh, will then give Einstein's solution. And uh, we see that his answer comes also from old ideas from Galileo. Then I will describe the of special relativity. I will introduce a Minkowski, Minkowski space-time and its pseudo Euclidean metrics. And then I will get to the most famous equation of all physics, E equal mc squared. We will try to find where it is coming from and what are the consequences of this equation. I will also uh, show that it's possible that uh, using the principle of relativity, one can retrieve uh, the equation of electromagnetism using a Lagrangian formulation. And at the end of the lecture, I will go to general relativity and talk about gravitation and try to explain why, uh, how Einstein came to the idea that gravitation was in fact a manifestation of the curvature of space-time. I will come back at the end to the historical developments and by describing what were the historical tests of the theory of relativity, and I will conclude by some remarks. So in this lecture, everything starts from the experiment of Michelson. Michelson asked himself a very simple question, uh, which was, is it possible to measure, to observe the velocity of the Earth in the ether? The ether was a medium which was supposed to carry light and all the electromagnetic waves. The ether was everywhere in the universe because we receive light from the stars and from the universe as a whole. So it was supposed that the Earth moving around in the ether, the velocity of light should, the apparent velocity of light should change depending upon the relative directions of the Earth and the light beam. And so Michelson invented an apparatus which is called the Michelson interferometer. You see here. Uh, a sketch of this interferometer, and you see in the photograph uh, the historical setup. It was an interferometer which was placed on a platform, a very solid uh, granite platform, which was floating on a bath of mercury. So it was possible to rotate the platform and to change the direction of the light beam with respect to the direction of the Earth on its orbit. On the next slide, I give a more precise description of this interferometer that you might uh, be familiar with. If you have done some optics, you have a source of light. The light comes on a beam splitter, which splits the light into two arms, this one and that one. The arms are L meter long. The, the light is reflected on two mirrors, comes back on the beam splitter, and you detect the light in the other arm with 
some kind of detector, an eyepiece or a telescope. And what you expect to see are fringes, which come from the interference of the light bouncing back in these two arms. And the position of the fringes depends on the relative length of the two arms, or equivalently depends on the difference of time of flight of light along the two passes. And the idea of Michelson was that uh, if the velocity of the light is parallel to this arm, uh, the light will take a time different from the one it will take in the other arm where the light is propagating normal to the direction of the Earth. So he tried the experiment. His experiment was sensitive to a displacement of about, about one twentieth of a fringe. The effect which was expected was about four, five or ten times bigger, and he never saw any displacement of the fringes in this experiment. So the question was, what is happening to the uh, what what was wrong? I give here a calculation of the expected effect because we will see that the formulas here will be very important in the following. Here I am. Here you see the time it takes for the light to go back and forth along this street. It's very simple. It's if L is the length of the arm, the velocity of the light is C plus V in one direction, C minus V in the other. So you have to add these two times and it's a very simple calculation. You find this expression, two L over C, one plus V squared over C squared. Now you have to compare this with the velocity, with the time it takes in the other arm. And you see that in the other arm, the situation is different. The velocity is here. So the light which bounces on the distributor has to go at an angle to meet the mirror which has moved with the earth. And so you see now that the path, the length of the path is these two blue lines, a kind of zigzag, and you have to compute this length. And you do that using the Pythagorean theorem. You see that the light has traveled during time V to V T during the, on the length V T T2 here. And you have to compare it to, to see what was the, uh, the total time. So you have the equation here, T2 is two over C times this length. You have T2 in it, you can extract T2 from this equation and you find a result which is different from the one here by a factor of two. You see that it takes uh, half the time, the correction to two L over C is half smaller in the second pass than in the first one, which means that if you take the difference of these times, you see now that you expect a fringe shift which is CT1 minus T2 over lambda, where lambda is a wavelength, you have to find this expression here, which should lead to 0 0.2 plus or minus 0 0.2 fringe. You see that this calculation is made assuming that the length of each arm is 11 meter, lambda is 0 0.5 micrometer. So L over lambda is 210 to the seven, nu over C 10 minus, is 10 minus four. And when you put all these figures, you find this. So they expected a shift of plus or minus 0.2 fringes when they were rotating this apparatus and they never saw anything. They tried the experiment for many months and they had to admit this is the most famous experiment in physics, which gives a negative result, which is also very important in this case. But they had to be very careful. And the last point I want to make is that it's, it was not possible to make an interferometer 11 meter longer. You saw in the picture that the size was about one meter and they need to have the right sensitivity. They needed to have a very long arm. So they used the trick, which I show on the next slide. You, you see what they did is to fold each of these paths was folded with set of mirrors. You see four, four mirrors here, four mirrors here, four here and four here. The light is coming in, falls on the beam splitter. Half of the light is zigzagging along this direction. And the other half of the light is zigzagging here. And finally, they recombine and come into the telescope detector. It was very difficult to do at that time because they had no lasers. Today, it would be easier with laser beams, but they were working with classical light, which was they had to use telescopes. They had to use a lot of focusing techniques. It was a very difficult experiment. And they had to be very careful to make sure that if they did not see anything, it was due not to experimental errors, but to the fact that there were no effect. And so this is what puzzled uh, Lord Kelvin. He said, what, is, what happens with the ether? What, what are the properties of a system which did not uh, 
which, which uh, in which uh, light keeps the same velocity whatever you are going in or out uh, with respect to uh, to the source of light so the problem lasted uh, until Einstein was interested in the question in fact Einstein does not seem to have given much interest into the Michelson experiment Einstein was thinking fundamentally and theoretically try to understand the problem of light and uh, the problem of Maxwell's equation from first principles and uh, you will see uh, what I would like to show in this lecture is uh, his fantastic intuition and how he was in his boldness because he made very simple assumption which led to unbelievable consequences that people of, that, of his time did not trust and did not want to admit and still he stick to these ideas because I came from a very first from a very simple idea and he said that this, this idea had to be right and we had to follow the consequences in a rational way so let me just try to tell you how it worked in fact since he was very young Maxwell was uh, Einstein was interested in understanding Maxwell's equation and one of the questions he asked himself is is it possible to catch up with a light beam? What would it be like if you were able to surf on a light wave to be at the same speed? And then very strange things should happen because if you are at the same speed, the electric and magnetic fields do not vary in time anymore. And we have seen that the, the property of Maxwell's equation, the fact that light is propagating comes from the fact that a change in the electric field produces a magnetic field whose change produces an electric field and so on. But if you are frozen at the velocity of light, this does not work anymore. And so there was a big question about what happens and how, what, what can you do? How can you understand that? And then thinking about that, Einstein came back to an old idea by Galileo. Galileo had said, and I, I mentioned that in the first lecture, that uh, the laws of mechanics experiments that you can do by throwing objects in the air and looking how they fall and how they uh, how they behave does not depend on whether you are so to speak still or if you are moving at a constant speed there is no way you can decide whether or not you are moving by doing an experiment of mechanics and einstein had the intuition to extend this notion not only to mechanics, but to all of physics and in particular to electromagnetic waves. So Einstein said, Maxwell's equation tells us that the velocity of light is 300,000 kilometers per second. This is a law of nature. So it should be true for all observers who, who are in, with, a con with a constant velocity with respect to one another. And he said, if by doing an experiment, you find that the velocity of light is different, you would know that you are moving. And this is not possible because the principle is that there is no way to know whether one moves or not, with a, of course, not with acceleration, but with the uniform speed. And this idea is simple. It means that physics should be universal because if it depends on, on where you are, it would mean that physics is different on the Earth, on Mars, on Venus, because they are all moving with respect to one another. So if the laws of physics are the same everywhere, the velocity of light being a law of physics should be the same for all observers. So it's a very simple idea. It's the only one that Einstein introduced for the special theory of relativity. But it has very, very deep consequences because if you are not able to add or to subtract the velocity of light from any other one, it means that the law of velocity combinations V1 plus V2 uh, if you go like this, uh, V1 minus V2, if you go in the same direction, these laws were known since antiquity and Newton admitted them because they are based on the fact that time is universal, the time is the same for everyone, and the, the length of rods, the measurement of space is also the same for everyone. And so if you give up the fact that the velocity of light changes according to the observer, you have to give up this fundamental law of universality of time and space. So this is the end of Newtonian physics, which postulates the invariance of time and length intervals in inertial frames or Galilean frames. So starting from that, Einstein did not do any experiment. It was not like Michael said, he just want, thought about that. 
He was at the time, as you know, a clerk in the patent office in Bern. He had a lot of time to think about things like that. And he imagined thought experiments. He imagined experiments that you do in a moving frame. And at that time, the fastest moving frames were trains, because the development of trains developed everywhere in Europe and in America. And he imagined experiments done in trains and in, in, in a car, in a train. And of course, the effect he was looking for were very, very small because the velocity of the trains is very small compared to the velocity of light. But this did not concern him. He wanted to understand what was going on in principle. And he could imagine that the trains were going much faster. So the first thing he challenged was the notion of simultaneity. How, when can you say that two events occur at the same time? Of course, it's, if they occur at the same place, it's obvious because you just have to compare uh, the time of the event to, to the handle of a clock and you see which one is first or if they came at the same time. But the situation is much more tricky if the events occurred at two different places. Then what is the, the simplest solution, uh, which Einstein stated is that if you stand just midway between the two events, and if the light triggered by each event reach you at the same time, then the events are simultaneous. Because since light is going at the same speed from any direction and for any observer, if it takes the same time to get to you, and if you are in the middle, it means that the events are simultaneous. So it's a very simple definition. And from this definition, he was able to understand immediately that simultaneity was a relative concept. And he imagined an experiment with two observers there is one which, who is standing just on the platform, uh, in the middle of the platform. I, I will call, it, call her Alice, because uh, there is a lot of discussion in physics nowadays about Alice and Bob who are sharing experiments. So let's call this uh, observer Alice. And on, uh, in the car, there is another passenger called Bob. And Bob is also sitting just in the middle of the car. At some point in time, the head of the car comes to point B, whereas the end of the car was at point A. B and A being the, the, the beginning and the end of the platform. And now let's imagine a very unlikely event that lightning is striking at point B and A. Alice, which is standing at the middle of the platform, sees the two lightning arriving at the same time. So for her, the, the events are simultaneous. Now she looks at the train and what does she see? She sees that Bob is running towards point B. So the light coming from B has a shorter trip to do than the light coming from A to reach Bob. And since the light goes at the same speed in both directions, clearly she sees that Bob sees light from B before light from A. And Bob has to see the same. Otherwise it would contradict causality. So for Bob, he does not know that he is moving. That he has no way to know that he is moving. But for Bob, B comes before A. And he, what he says is as valid as what Alice is observing. So you see that the notion of simultaneity is dependent on the observer. Time does not, uh, a simultaneity is not the same for Alice and for Bob. Of course, with the velocity of trains, we are talking about femtoseconds, nanoseconds, things that nobody was able to observe, but still, as a matter of principle, there is this very big difference. Then he did another sort of experiment. He showed by this experiment that the time does not click, does not evolve at the same rate for Alice and Bob. For that, he uh, imagined a very simple experiment again. He assumed that Alice and Bob each of them is carrying a clock. And it's a very special clock that you can see here, two mirrors, two mirrors with light beam going vertically up and down. And there is a light pulse going from one mirror to the other. And each time the light has made a round trip, a little bit of the light is transmitted through a semi-transparent mirror and reach a detector which clicks. So you have a periodic clicking like a pendulum with the period 2L over C. They make sure that their pendulum, there are two optical clocks. This is an optical clock. And by the way, 
At that time, it was supposed to be just a sort of experiment, but now we do optical clocks like that, and, and I, we will, I will discuss that later in the lectures. So what uh, uh, they do is that Alice keeps a clock on the ground, Bob takes a clock with him, and then they compare. Alice looks, so again, I am saying what Alice is seeing. Alice is looking at the light of Bob's clock in the train. And what she sees is that the light in, in the train is zigzagging, of course, because the mirrors are moving. And it's again the same calculation as for Michelson experiment. What she finds is that the time it takes for the light to make a round trip in Bob's clock is 2L over C time one over time one over square root of one minus V square over C square. So what she finds is that the period of Bob's clock is slow, is longer. The, uh, the clock uh, of Bob is ticking at a different slower than her clock. So this shows that time does not evolve at the same rate in for Bob and Alice. So some people then made the following objection. Oh, but it's a very special clock. You, you did that with a clock which depends on light because you have this idea of the constant velocity of light. But after all, how can you make sure that it, does, it works the same for another clock? So Einstein said, so let's now do the experiment. Alice is carrying not only that clock, but another one, let's say a chronometer or a whole hands pendulum. And so does Bob. Uh, the, the pendulum of Bob should be slower too. Why? Because if he was not, Bob, by comparing his optical clock and his chronometer, would know that he's moving on Earth, on the ground. They both clicked at the same rate. When he goes on the train, one clicks at a different rate. So this would contradict the principle of relativity. So the, this slowing down is not a property of a special clock. It's a property of time. And it, he even went further, and his friend uh, Paul Langevin uh, made a very famous uh, lecture in Bologna in 1911, in which he went much further than that. He assumed, he said, let's take two twins. One twin stays on the ground. The other twin goes on a rocket, makes a very long trip at a velocity not uh, very far from the velocity of light. When the traveler twin will come back on Earth, he will be much younger than his sedentary twin. Exactly for the same reason, because this ticking at a slower rate is also valid for biological rhythms, for heartbeats, and for everything. And this is something that very few people could believe in, because of course the velocities we could reach at that time were far from the velocity of light and the effect was very small. The effect is very small up to now, but still, it's a very important effect because it is, it's exactly what happens in the atomic clocks which are carried, for example, in the GPS system. A clock which is rotating around the Earth at a velocity of about 3.9 kilometers per second on the orbit, you have an effect which is eight part in 10 minus 11, and this amounts to seven microseconds per day. And this is a very important because in seven microseconds, light travels on a distance of kilometers. It means that if you didn't correct for this effect in the algorithm which give you your position with the GPS, the GPS would be wrong by kilometers and be completely uh, ineffective. So this effect of special relativity, the relativity of time, the dilation of time for moving uh, uh, reference frame is very important. Then another thought experiment, which will show that not only time is uh, relative to the observer, but also that the measurement of lenses is relative to the observer. And this experiment is again very simple. What, what uh, we do exactly the same experiment as before, but now Bob takes his clock, which was vertical, turn it so that the light will be back and forth along the direction of the train. What we saw in this when we described the Michelson experiment is that the time it takes to go back and forth in this way is different from the time it takes to go back and forth in this way for Alice. So, but if it's true for Alice, it should be true for Bob too. 
And then there is a problem because Bob, by just rotating his clock, would know that he's moving because the clock should not change uh, if you apply the principle of relativity. So the only way out of this paradox is to say that when you turn this in this way, your clock for Alice, the clock is no, has no longer the lens L. The lens becomes smaller in this direction for Alice. And this compensates for the fact that uh, uh, the, the, the time it would take for back and forth for a given lens would be longer. So you see that if you want to be consistent, you have to admit that not only time intervals depend on the observer, but that lens measurements depend on the observable too. The lens is contracted for when the rod or when the, it's measured along the direction of the motion. It's not changed when it's measured normal to the direction of the motion. So these are, you see that you get these effects very simply and you have this factor one, gamma is equal to one over square root of one minus V square over C square, which is called the Lorentz factor, which appears everywhere in the theory. It is a factor which, ex which expresses the dilation of time and the contraction of lenses when you uh, observe things in different reference frames. So this now, on the next slide, I just remind you or tell you how you change coordinates when you go from one reference frame to another one. This is just a summary, a mathematical summary of what I have expressed just by word before. So I just click this uh, uh, formulas on the board and try to explain you uh, what it means. We are looking, we assume two observers, for example, in, in reference frame R, we have Alice, and in reference frame R prime, which is moving with velocity V along the X axis, you have Bob. And what you want to do is to relate the coordinate X T of an event for Alice to the same event coordinate X prime T prime for Bob. And I have chosen a special case where the motion is along X. Uh, so Y and Z are not changed. And you see the formulas on the board, which are called the Lorentz formulas. X prime is equal to gamma times X minus VT. Y and Z, Z are not changed. T prime is equal to gamma T minus VX over C square. And the factor gamma is the Lorentz factor. We call that Lorentz transformation because they were derived by Lorentz before Einstein. Lorentz tried to find the transformation which leave Maxwell's equation unchanged. But this was a mathematical proof and he did not go to the physical implication of that and he never talked about the relativity of time and relativity of lenses. So it was just a mathematical formula which were developed by Lorentz and Poincaré a few months before Einstein. Uh, you can, when you have this equation, you can also look at the formula which gives the composition of velocities. And you find indeed that the velocity cannot go beyond the velocity of light. You see, it's called u, the velocity for Alice, the velocity u prime for Bob is u minus v. This is the classical result. This would be the result if there were no relativity, but it's corrected by the denominator one minus uv over c squared. And if you apply this formula, if you give to u or u prime the velocity of light, you find that the other one is also the velocity of light. You cannot add anything to the velocity of light. So this is very important consequence. Another important consequence that I will discuss later is that if you take a time interval between two events, delta t squared, and if you me measure also the space interval, delta x squared, delta y squared, delta z squared, you can build a quantity which is c squared delta t squared, the square of the time normalized by c, so that you have the same unit as the length, minus the square of the distance between the events. This quantity is the same for all observers. This is called a 4D distance. It's defined, it's, it's an extension of Pythagoras formula. In Pythagoras formula, you know that the the square of the distance between two points, x square plus y square plus z square. In, in this space where you mix time and space, you add a fourth dimension. And the distance with two events is given by the square of the time minus the square of the space component. And you can verify as an exercise from Lorentz formulas that this is true. And it's called 
the, Minko the Minkowski distance, which is a kind of pseudo Euclidean distance, which involves four coordinates instead of three. So, and I will come back to this because it's an important effect, it has important consequences. I just want to show or to, to remind you also, and so obvious that if you at very small velocities, gamma goes to one. And all these formulas go back to Galilean transformation, Newtonian transformation. And so you see that classical mechanics and classical physics is recovered in this uh, uh, perspective when the velocity of light becomes very, very small compared to the velocity of light. Now, uh, what I want to do here in a couple of minutes is uh, to show you how Einstein came to the Lorentz transformation. Lorentz and Poincaré used a very elaborate uh, formalism. What is really beautiful with Einstein is that he does think very simply and just from his intuition and from first principle. So what Einstein did is the following. He said, we have to relate x, t, x prime t prime to x t. One event for Bob, how it is seen by Alice. The relationship should be linear. Linear means that you sh it should not depend on x square or t square. So it's a linear formula. And the, this linear formula should obey something very simple. You see, I have written x prime minus ct prime has to be equal to x minus ct. Why? What does it mean? I, uh, co consider the following event. You start from the origin, which is the same for the two uh, uh, frames, or reference frames. And light is going to point X during time T. It reached time T, point X at time T. What is the relation between X and T? It's of course X minus CT equals zero. But you should have also X prime minus CT prime equals zero because light goes at the same speed for the two frames. And so you should have linear relations which give zero uh, for both. And the only way you can do that is by assuming that these two quantities are proportional to each other. When one reaches zero, the other will be zero. So you have one constant lambda. You can say also that x plus ct, when x plus ct is equal to zero, x prime plus ct prime is equal to zero because it's just propagation in the opposite direction. So you get now x prime plus ct prime is equal to mu x plus ct. And you see now that instead of four parameters, you are left only with lambda and mu. So just by saying that light goes at the same speed for both observers, he reduced four parameters to two. So we just have to find now lambda and mu. So the next step is very simple. What Einstein did is to add and subtract these two formula. If you add them, you see that CT disappears on the left hand side and you get X prime is equal to mu plus lambda over two X plus mu minus lambda over two CT. And ct prime is equal to mu plus lambda over two ct plus mu minus lambda over two x. This is just a very simple. And now, what he has to do is to reduce this to to find another equation. The other equation is if you take x prime is equal to zero, that is, if you are at the origin of the moving frame, if x prime is equal to zero, x of course is equal to vt because this is the motion of the second frame with respect to the first one. So you just express the fact that x prime to zero implies x equal to vt, and you find lambda minus mu over lambda plus mu is equal to v over c. So now you have a relationship between lambda and mu, and you still need another equation. What, what is the fact that we have not used up to now? We have not used the fact that time of, uh, elapses at a different rate depending on the observer and you do it next what you consider is what Alice is looking at, at Bob in the train when at time t where is Bob at time t for Alice Bob is at the point vt so vt t and we have to find what what is t prime for the point vt t and this is what I have written here you see that t prime is equal to lambda plus mu over 2t minus lambda over mu over 2v over c because of this relation time t. And now you can develop this and you find that t prime is equal to t 
lambda plus mu over two times one over minus v square over c square. But you know that this should be equal to t square root of one minus v square over c square. You know the time dilation effect. And from this, you immediately get lambda plus mu over two is equal to gamma. And it's finished. You have all what you need, and then you get the Lorentz transformation. So it's a very uh, intuitive and, and, and physical way to get the Lorentz transformation. You don't have to discuss group theory, uh, conservation of Maxwell's equation, and so on. You get it just assuming that the velocity of light is the same for the two observers. Now, uh, what made uh, Einstein confident that he was on the right track was an old experiment that I described to you last week, FISO experiment. FISO had tried to measure the velocity of light in a flow of water. And I told you that when he combined the velocity of the flow with the velocity of light, he found a result which was bigger than the result that he observed. And Einstein has now a very clear explanation. You just have to take the law of combination of velocities, which I uh, have written here. The first with the relation epsilon is equal to this equation to plus one when V1 and V2 are in opposite direction, and epsilon is minus one when they're in the same direction. And I remind you that in this experiment, half of the beam is split into two parts. One is circulating along the direction of of the flow and the other one against and you have to subtract the phases and the calculation is very simple you use now the combination of velocities given by Lorentz transformations you get what I show you here the velocity of the light is of course c over n plus epsilon v and you have this correction of the denominator and you find very simply that the phase difference between the two passes is different from what is expected classically by this one over n square term, which is a relativistic correction. You see, it's less dramatic than in Michelson experiment because you don't get a zero result, but you get a result smaller than expected. Why don't you get a zero result? Because in the medium, light is going at c or n, which is smaller than c c over n which is smaller than c so the combination of velocity allows you to change a little bit the velocity of light because you don't reach the value c and so it's a very beautiful illustration of the relativity ideas one should say it's a post-diction because the experiment was done before and then later einstein understood what was uh, mysterious before and again, you can compare with Michelson experiment. And you can see by, by comparing the, the precision of this measurement, you can see the evolution of technology between 1850 and 1887. Uh, Physio experiment was less sensitive than Michelson's one. Now, a few words about the Minkowski space. I remind you that in, in, now we are talking about space time. It's a continuum of space time. When, when you go from one observer to another one, the coordinate of space and time mix together. So you cannot separately consider time and space. And what is conserved is the square of the time, uh, time interval multiplied by C squared minus the, the distance squared, the special distance squared. And now you can distinguish three different cases. If this quantity d squared is positive, what does it mean? It means that c squared t squared is larger than the distance squared. It means that light can go from one event to the other in a time shorter than uh, it takes for uh, delta t square is larger than dl square over c square. So the time interval is larger than the time it takes for the light to get from one point to the other. This means that one event may have influenced the other because light can reach the second point in a time shorter. Uh, but I mean that the time takes for the light to reach the two points in this expression 
is larger than the distance itself. So in fact, the light is going at, at a larger distance of the separation of the two points. So one uh, event may have influenced the other. And we call this a time-like distance. On the other hand, if d square is negative, which means that if you want to give a meaning to d, that d is imaginary, we call, it's called a space-like distance. And it means that light does not have the time to go from one event to the other, which means that the events cannot influence each other. And in fact, in this case, uh, the events can even have another order when you change the reference frame. If d square is negative, one, the, the, the one event can occur before in one frame and after in the other frame. On the other hand, if d square is positive, the ordering of events is the same for all observers. And you see the last case is d square equal to zero. This means that uh, these events are such that the light can, the, the events which are all the, the points which are reached by light uh, originating from point O at time t equals zero. And it makes a cone in the Minkowski space. It's a kind of, uh, you have a sheet a conic sheet positive and negative. The negative conic sheet corresponds to the events which are in the past of the event zero. And the positive conic sheet corresponds to the points which are in the future of the event. By past and future, I mean that the events may have influenced each other. An event occurring in the negative, uh, in the negative sheet of the, inside the cone may have influenced what happened at time t equals zero. And an event which is in the positive sheet may have been influenced by something which happened at time t equals zero. On the other hand, events which occurred outside, for example, the planes that I have shown here, are events which are separated from the origin by a space like distance. And these events have no causal relationship. The order of the events can change depending upon whether you are in one uh, reference frame or another one. Another point about the Minkowski uh, point, uh, description, I, I talk here about the world line of a particle in the Minkowski space. What is a world line of a particle? It's a succession of events which correspond to the passage of the particle at different point in, in Minkowski space. And I consider here uh, a world line which passes through the origin. That is a particle at time t equals zero, the particle at point x equals zero of this uh, uh, space. And you see the, what I have drawn here. You have a, a world line which is uh, a curve, but the point that the curve must be inside the cone because the different points on this curve can influence each other. This is a trajectory of a of a given particle and it has been it has to be always inside this uh, cone minkowski cone there is an important uh, uh, concept that you, you can define here, here which is the proper time of the particle what is assume that you have a clock which, which is attached to the particle and consider what happens in the reference frame which is tangent to the particle at a given time. But what I mean is that I consider a reference frame which moves with the velocity, with the instantaneous velocity of the particle. In this reference frame, the particle is motionless. So delta L is equal to zero. It does not move. So the delta S squared, the Minkowski uh, metric, is just delta to square, just the time square. So in this frame, the distance, the Minkowski distance, is just c squared time, the time given by the clock attached to the particle. When the particle moves, you have to change the frame at each time. But you see that you can, if you want to measure the length of the curve, the length of the trajectory, you have to add all these delta two uh, squared terms. And what you find is uh, that uh, the length the, according to this metric, the length of the trajectory is just the, the square of, of the time of the, which is read by the clock attached to, to the particle, which moves the particle. But the important point is this time 
this length is the same for all observers. If you take another observer, he will measure it and he will have at the same time delta T and delta L. But when he adds everything, he will find the delta 2 of uh, the clock attached to the particle because D square is an invariant, a relativistic invariant, the same for all. And this will have interesting consequences. So this quantity delta S over C is called the proper time as a particle. And it is the same, it is a time which is counted by a clock attached to the particle. And now uh, we can come back now in a, with a more detailed explanation to the twins paradox. I, I, I have drawn you here uh, the trajectory of the twin, which is going out in the rocket at time, the time of liftoff when the twin leaves uh, the, uh, uh, the Earth. We are at point O, and the twin is making a trajectory. And at point A, his world line meets the vertical world line. What is the vertical world line? It is the world line of the, of the uh, sedentary twin. The twin has remained motionless on Earth, and in the reference frame of the sedentary twin, you have this description. Okay. And now let's compare. The time which have elapsed for the two for the, the traveling and the sedentary twin. I call you see here I have called D tau the proper time of the traveling twin. And D tau is equal to uh, the D square of the twin which has remained on Earth because this quantity is the same for everyone. For, for the twin remaining on Earth, you have this. Uh, d tau square is equal to c squared dt squared minus d squared minus dy squared minus dz squared. But what is dx squared over dt squared? This is the square of the velocity along x of the traveling twin. dy squared over dt squared, this is the velocity over y uh, squared over c squared, and so on. And you see that d tau is equal to square root of y minus v squared over c squared times dt. And what you see from this is that the time which has elapsed for the traveling twin, this proper time, is always smaller than the time corresponding to uh, the sedentary twin because the square root I have here is smaller than one. So you see here that in this way that you confirm the results, the increments d tau are always smaller than the dt's measured in the Earth's rest frame. And hence, the proper time elapsed for the traveling twin is smaller than the one measured by the sedentary twin. The effect uh, has already been discussed in the trained thought experiment. There is a last point that I did not discuss yet is the fact that I did not consider the fact that uh, the traveling twin is in a gravitational field and you have accelerations. So this is just spatial relativity, but we will see uh, in the second part of the talk, that when you go to general relativity, this conclusion is not changed. The traveling twin is aging less than the sedentary one. And I think it's a good time to stop here. I will stop for 10 minutes and resume at five past five. Uh, I want to say also at the end or at the beginning of next lecture, if you have questions, you, you are, of course, uh, you're welcome to ask to discuss it.